I know you, uh, I'm Art Seavey, I know you've heard a lot from me uh, over the past two days. Um, Dr. Linda Noble, we just want to provide, take this hour to have a conversation about the USG work around Complete College Georgia, provide an update on that, um, have a few points of conversation with you all, get some feedback, ask some questions and so on. Um, so informal, raise your hand whenever, we've got a mic running around, Leslie Ann will come find you. Um, and we are taping this again, so um, just please speak into the mic when you ask, but raise your hand, stop us at any point. Um, what I want to do is start at the end. You know, we kind of threw a, a Mack truck at you last year with guidelines of the plan saying do everything or pick from this whole host of menus of options. I think um, starting at the end, the focus this year really is on this idea of first year success, learner relationship management, and implementation drivers. And we're going to talk about kind of what, what all those mean um, as some fancy words. I want to do that. We, uh, starting at the end a year ago, we started with a statewide plan. Remember you were here. We went to the summit, learned how to do the plans, and we had the campus plans. And um, from there, I'm going to go and talk about kind of uh, where we've been, some of the context, how we set up the environment for it, all these different commissions that have been going on, some of the planning work that we've done. Um, talk about some of the connecting work, including what the purpose of this summit, which hopefully you know the, the purpose at this point, but if not, we can still talk about that. And then we have Dr. Ken Harmon here to talk about the policy review task force as kind of this, this type of connecting work. And then I just want to talk about some future stuff, um, some things I hope you'll be a little excited about on how to drive the implementation further. And then Linda's going to round it out with what, what the next steps are for the campus plans. So back to the beginning. Anybody can do the math real quick? <laughs> this is what we suggested as instructions. 465 pages. Um, we got that in, and after careful analysis, the big conclusion from the plans is that you all follow instructions just about as well as students. <laughs> uh, we did read 636 pages. A lot of us did, I promise, um, if you didn't think we were. <laughs> So going from the campus plans, um, talking about this contextual issues, we had consolidation, big changes over the past year. Distance Ed Task Force, if you haven't read that. Um, John Sizemore's here, Mike Rogers is here to answer some questions if, you, if you'd like about that. The Metrics Task Force, the Funding Commission, all these big environmental issues. We've done a lot with transforming remediation and kind of what are the next steps with that. And then I want to focus just on the plan review to provide you a little bit of feedback on what we saw in the plans and how that's informing our work and how we can support you moving forward. So back to this, it really is a rich set of information. We haven't had that, that um, formal data on all these different areas that all the campuses are working on and it's been extremely helpful in our planning and understanding and we've been matchmaking with institutions, we've been providing other types of support. It shows us where strengths are, where you, areas for improvement, um, you've all highlighted different policies and a lot of different data insights beyond just the usual metrics that you had on your campuses. And they're all available at that link. So if you haven't checked, um, I encourage you to go read through the 636 pages yourself, or at least do a keyword search on, certain, on different things or look at institutions that you want to look at. Uh, proof that we really did look at these. <laughs> we divided actually everybody up into groups, and over a few days um, on SharePoint and others, discussed different institutions, we picked apart different topic areas, put them on the wall, figured out how that should inform our planning. And the thing that I really want to emphasize in this is that we did something we asked you all to do and that we started talking to each other. So you'll see people who have a background in data and research, institutional research. You'll see people from information technology, from the adult learning consortium, from people focused on remediation, from our STEM coordinator, distance education, policy, faculty development, all of them coming together to look at this from a holistic sense, which we know we have to do, um, which often does not happen in, in higher education. So recurring topics that you all gave us, 
And again, some of these we knew we were coming because we asked you to do it. But there were certain, some surprises. Sorry about that. A lot of focus on learning communities. Um, pretty much every plan flagged advising, even though we didn't specifically call that out. A lot on reverse transfer, course flexibility, um, and a lot on availability of data. So looking at this, though, if we make some type of judgment on what it was like, um, K through 12 outreach. We talked a lot about K through 12. We could see this as a, as a big area of room for improvement in that it really was about just K through 12 outreach, as in we're going to have a program, we're going to try to recruit students in. It wasn't really about alignment or working with Common Core or having faculty work with people from K through 12. So we need to see in this step and moving beyond outreach to more alignment and partnerships. We can talk about that. Um, remediation, collaboration with TCSG, course flexibility. Quite a lot on that. I think we're moving along. These other areas in yellow, availability of data, underserved student populations, prior learning, advising. We'll go into a little more specifics, but I think it's kind of yellow, whatever that means. Um, good and interesting. Um, things where maybe we should all be talking to each other. For example, advising. Uh, many said, we need to move to centralized advising. Others are saying, we need to move to decentralized advising and had similar arguments for each, um, or conflicting arguments with each. So I think there's, there's room for information sharing around what everybody's learning, what they're doing, and trying to say really what's the best model for that. Um, same with prior learning, that there's a lot of good work from the Adult Learning Consortium, but kind of the, the set of how you then scale that or, or what's, what's right for your individual institution and what's right for the student. Um, still a lot of work to be done and a lot of talking that we could do to get there on that. Underserved student populations. Um, I put this in yellow uh, based on feedback that we got because it's, we initially put out this idea of certain demographics, certain populations, because that's an easy shorthand way of looking at um, you know, racial, ethnic diversity, low income, first generation. And certainly those were called out, but I think the next step to move beyond that um, is to figure out really what are the services for those students. We saw the data, we saw the disaggregated data that um, in certain identifying who's performing or underperforming um, compared to other populations. But really, there's, there's a lot more work that could be done on how to address that and what are some commonalities across these populations. So I think room for improvement on that. Um, some interesting exemplars, and we've been calling these out at different presentations we've been doing, not these specifically, but many others. Um, some in the area of analytics, others in advising, but here's just a few, and I encourage you, again, these are the types of interesting ideas that you can get from looking at the plans to go check it out. Again, we'll make all these presentations available later. So, summing up areas for growth. Um, one thing I didn't talk about, role of faculty. It, it really was missing across the board in plans. And, and we didn't ask for that specifically, but as, as uh, Tinto highlighted this morning, if the classroom is the main point of contact, what are we doing? How are we engaging faculty in this process? And so we want to look at how we can help you with that issue and how you might take the work in the plans and think about that further. Advising, being called out is extremely important. But again, not necessarily having the full answers for how to do it, understandably, um, something we can work on. Learning. Um, just an interesting idea that, that we still were stuck in this idea that either it's a course and we're stuck on credit accumulation or this, but trying to figure out what are alternative models that might look at uh, acquirement of learning. So we focused a lot on the instruction side, not on the student end, incorporating their prior learning or other forms of assessment, competency-based education maybe, new ideas like that, um, nothing across the board, which is fine, but something maybe we should talk about exploring, whether you're interested in that or what's going on with that. And then in K through 12 partnerships and alignment. And then I put these other three down there as uh, enablers of sort, that all of us have issues with access to data, use of data, but that we need that to facilitate the rest of these. And technology-enabled new models missing in some sense. Um, there are a few stellar examples, and we can point those out later, but this idea of how do we use technology beyond just 
distance education, but to enable improved learning, even, even on campus, um, I think a big area for growth. And then policy, which we'll talk about, uh, of how we can help and look at each other, look at each other's policies and the system policies and see what's a good operating environment um, to enable completion. So specific areas for collaboration that we've been talking about that stem from those areas for growth. Learner relationship management, which is kind of this newish fancy term that just makes sure that we take the IT side of analytics, the academic side of analytics, and combine that with interventions and early alert warning systems, looking at the whole actual student experience, not worrying about which part of campus that comes from or who's in charge of that, but what's the student experience to make sure that they're getting the support that they need when they need it. Uh, gateway courses, technology-enabled learning, and how we evaluate efforts, how we benchmark it, and how we know what we're doing, which we're gonna focus on a lot with helping you out, and policy. So, um, I just wanna stop here before we go on to the next set. Anything from the campus plans or anything from these areas for collaboration that you think stand out, that are more of more interest than you, or for you, anything that we're missing, um, what's something you're interested in working on together or something that we can help you out with in these areas that we saw um, all across the campus plans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, okay. <laughs> if, if we took these general areas for growth and said, what are specific things to focus on? I would, yeah. Got it, okay. So we're thinking potentially in gateway courses that, that you might need faculty development on how to do gateway courses. So these are more kind of the, the, the targets and then, yeah. Right. Yeah. And we're writing all this down. I promise we're listening. Or Linda is, and we got Brady sitting here. Any more? Go across. Chairs and deans evaluate teaching through various instruments. Are there any instruments in the USG system that evaluates advising, individual advice, and the quality of advice that each student receives? And do we need to, to actually put those in place? My guess is there's, can you all hear me? Uh, there's, to my knowledge, there's not a system-wide adopted methodology for evaluating advising. At the same time, many of our campuses evaluate advising, include advising and faculty performance expectations, and that would be an excellent area for collaboration because my guess is we have lots of really good examples about how that has worked into faculty expectations, rewarded and reinforced on our campuses. My voice probably carries. I probably don't need to mind that. Uh, <laughs> so we've got to report it into the, it's all right here. Okay. Uh, yeah, just picking up a little on the advising, at Southern Poly, we, we've actually instituted a four-hour uh, workshop on advising. Uh, all new faculty coming to the campus have to take it as part of faculty orientation, and we put all of our faculty through that four-hour um, two years ago, I guess it's been now, and, uh, and then we have an update every year that all faculty must take. So you know, we're seeing some improvement there with that. I know the other thing that we see is a lot of campuses put a lot of, you know, what I'll, what I'll refer to in a teaching and learning context as the content knowledge about advising uh, via technology, other methodologies, and the role of the faculty or the professional advisor in advising then becomes supplemental to that. So you don't spend your time as a faculty member going through a program of study. The student can engage in that, potentially do peer groups around that, and then come to the faculty member for the more specific role, the more mentoring, uh, kind of advising beyond course selection kind of role that faculty particularly can play. All right, we got some more. Again, we're highlighting these as, as areas that we want to hear from you about how we can best support you, and if these are the right areas. So I don't, I don't have any ideas about 
I, I was just intrigued by the, the point on the previous slide about uh, the now opportunity for growth is focusing on learning as opposed to courses and course credits. Um, and so the idea of collaborating and working together with folks to start to figure out other ways to sort of evaluate progress towards readiness for graduation other than counting credits. You know, one of the things that I'm struck by, and maybe I'm going to bring up the elephant in the room, but when we talk about faculty roles and faculty engagement with this, we have to find a way to integrate the importance of that and faculty roles with what they're already doing because it's a difficult time to feel like we are doing an add-on model to faculty. So the more we can incorporate the importance of faculty in this as part of what they do regularly with their students, that will be helpful. Otherwise, it's just a continual more students, more work, more et cetera. So we really have to find a way to in integrate this into the culture of, of learning on your campuses. All right, um, let's move on. Oh, one more, sorry. <laughs> Under the areas for growth, you had K to 12 partnerships. And I was wondering how the system is looking at that as something that could be systemic and not something that would just be this local school partners with this you know, K through 12 system and actually have something that comes from our system working together with their system and really having something that is a, a statewide model for how to do that and how to improve both systems by working together. Yeah, um, one of the examples I'm gonna highlight later is uh, some recent good work on Common Core Standards Alignment coming out. Um, and Tabitha, are you in the room? Can you stand up real quick? You call, yeah. Uh, this is Tabitha Press. She's uh, gonna be a K through, she is a K through 12 expert. Actually came from Department of Education and, and is gonna be working on exactly efforts like that. So um, we'll get you Tabitha's contact information, but there's, there's plenty of things she's working on that um, where we saw that's a big need and heard from the campus plans that that's a big need and, and saw that we should make an investment in that area. Um, so I'll highlight one example, and then Tabitha is a great resource to talk to. Okay, back to our little story, contextual environment, back to today. Um, these regional plans or regional priorities, again, not another layer of plans, but just how do you work together? How can we, as an example of something of, how can we connect you with other people in your region to continue implementing the work of the campus plans? Um, and then I wanna highlight what we're doing with the policy review task force. So we're gonna have Dr. Ken Harmon come up, and um, if you haven't heard about it, he's gonna give the introduction as to what it is, but it's another one of these examples of how we're kind of transitioning from planning to, and listening to what was in the plans to what what we should actually do something about and supporting that work. Good morning. Let me first uh, say it's an unusual phone call that you get from the system office that says, you know, we need a group that's going to look at uh, what policies we have in place that are a hindrance. And so, Houston, I think I see you hiding back there. Uh, my, Kudos to you and to your team for setting up that kind of environment. And let me also say that this, very honestly, is an open look. Uh, everything is on the table. Everything can be looked at. Um, I'm going to actually jump ahead a couple of slides here. And these are the uh, members of this committee. And I'll talk about what the committee's doing and all of that in just a moment. But what I wanted to get across is, are any members of the committee here? If so, could you stand up so we know who to ask the difficult questions to? <laughs> okay, fantastic. Thank you. All right, thanks. Um, and Linda, did you say we're going to get rid of uh, art, art history and psychology? That's what I'm okay. Um, anyway, but these are the members of the uh, committee. As I want you to see, these are folks from across all areas of the university, whether it's financial aid, enrollment services, 
student success, student services, uh, academics, et cetera. So there's all areas represented there. So there were a lot of people with a lot of expertise sitting around the table, and uh, I'd like to thank them for that. I'd also like to take a moment to also say thanks to, to Art, to Linda, uh, to Leslie Ann, to Brandy. Uh, they provided just invaluable contributions to our work and made it a, a whole lot easier for us. But let me jump back and talk about this committee. This committee, uh, as you can see up here, the purpose review system level policies as potential enablers and barriers to college completion. So that is, let's look at what we have and do we need to do something about it and what we don't have and do we need to put it in place. So again, everything is on the table. Um, when we got together as a committee, we were first looking at how do we evaluate policies? What kind of framework are we going to use? The framework that we did use is we first said, will this have an impact on completion? That's number one. Is there a distribution and equity issue here? How does it go across different groups? Um, also, is it feasible? Some, sometimes we have great ideas, just too expensive or just won't work. And, uh, but that's something that we're going to look at. Uh, and then we actually um, would then assess kind of what is the potential outcome of this uh, if we did make a change. So we use this framework to take policies and prioritize them on what we would need to do next. Okay? And stop me at any point if you've got a question. It also shows a few example policies here in a moment. Here we go. What we did is we, uh, first of all, some folks in the system office took a look at, the, uh, at some policies and just from their own experience and expertise had some suggestions. Then we also, I'm sure some of you were bombarded with emails uh, saying, please send us ideas. What I found on my own campus is people complained about a lot of policies. They were our own. They were not system policies. So we got our own work to do. Um, and I kept saying, boy, that's a great idea. Who is doing that? And then I found out we were. Um, but anyway, so we sent those out. We also, they, uh, they set up a, an online submission form, but we didn't want any barriers. If you didn't want to do the online submission form, send me an email, whatever it is. Just get your ideas to us. And what we found was once we really started distributing those emails, the ideas started coming in. And we had a lot of them. And so we met in an all-day session and got those policies and ran them through the framework. We thought we might get through five or ten. We got through all of them. I forgot how many that was. It was uh, about a hundred, Art said. Now, some of them did collapse into certain areas, so that made it a little bit easier. But look at uh, this is just kind of a representation. Uh, we grouped them by area somewhat. Uh, and then there's also, as you can imagine, sub-policies under some of these. Uh, financial aid, tuition, affordability. Talked about the idea of uh, textbooks and the cost of textbooks and what we have seen in some states where they do more open source. Is there anything that could be done uh, at the system level to promote something uh, with the cost of textbooks? Just an open question, could something be put in place? Uh, transparency and communication on financial aid, we find that that's a huge barrier to people. Again, what can we do there? Uh, some of these could be policies, some of them could be practices, uh, but we didn't want to quibble about that. We want to just do the right thing for completion. Um, payment plans, as we know, that, that's, a, that's kind of a touchy subject, but then some people are finding a way to do that. And so could there be something in place? Uh, and again, everything's a possible discussion. Uh, transfer and articulation, impact of new models. The dreaded word MOOCs came up about a hundred times. And um, as, uh, as my good friend Svi sitting here has noted, we don't get a lot of completion out of MOOCs, which is an excellent point. But the idea of at least large online courses and students trying to get credit for that kind of learning, how are we going to incorporate that? It is a new day, and we're going to have to at least pay attention to it. So what policies do we need there, and is there something we could do system-wide? Uh, transient process, online courses, again, MOOCs come up, but also this idea of students being transient students taking an online course in the summer 
And guess what? We put up a lot of barriers. Um, yeah, and and I'll, I'll take the blame on that as well. When we bring students in just to say, I'm going to take one class, I'm going to take this one online class, well, we need you to get a, a, give us all this information, et cetera. And we make it just a little too difficult, and is there something we can do to streamline that? Um, prior learning standardization, there's a hot topic. Um, at least it is on my campus. Um, but this whole idea of PLA and what can we do uh, to make that a, a more palatable uh, type of item for a lot of uh, campuses and maybe some standardization uh, of PLA. And that, as Art was just noting, uh, the idea that just more hours standing in front of the sage on the stage is maybe not necessarily the, uh, the notion of learning, but instead maybe we should measure learning. And so that question comes up, and could we have practices and policies in place for that? Um, Reverse transfer is, is another discussion. You know, when a student transfers one institution to another, completes a certain number of hours and could actually effectively transfer back, get that uh, associate's degree and then continue. Sometimes we find that students, if they have those benchmarks of success, uh, that it will motivate them to keep going. Or if they do stop, they at least have something to show for it. And they don't just have a bunch of hours sitting out there. Uh, personnel advising, we did talk about the notion of advising, role of faculty in advising, and the idea of professional advising. Not sure what we can do at the system level, but it's at least an open question, and we can at least share some practices and things there. But maybe there are some policies that could go into place. Um, some of these are just how we address uh, subgroups, et cetera. Compass testing, another one. Uh, what is the role of a compass test? And are we using a compass test in the appropriate way? I'll just ask that as a rhetorical question. Um, and also, probably, I think the item that came up first in our discussion is what's shown last up here, and that's information sharing. The idea that a student goes to one of our campuses and gives a whole bunch of information, and if they come to another campus, they have to give a whole bunch of information again, and it almost doesn't seem to make sense. I think we have computers now, and so we can probably share some of that information in some appropriate way. I know there are some, some guidelines that could be a hindrance, but why not look at that and take a look at what we could do there? Now, when we look at our committee and our charge, it is to prioritize these policies and procedures, primarily policies, and say, what could we put in place or what could we redo that would really have an impact on completion? And we're to draft a report in March. By the end of March, I believe, is our deadline. Um, but the idea is to draft a report with a priority of policies to consider. As much as we would like to, we're not solving all the problems quite yet. Our idea is to take a look and say, does this policy need addressed? And if so, by whom? Does it need uh, some kind of revision? Does it need to be added? Does additional research need to be done, et cetera? So kind of what's the next step for that uh, to address that particular policy? So that's actually what we are uh, are drafting as our recommendations for each of those policies. Um, one thing we also realized, it was frankly fantastic to sit in a room with a lot of knowledgeable people and have them share ideas to make things better for completion. And we should not just do it this one time. So we are going to discuss also uh, how to make this a sustainable process. Uh, how to keep going in the future uh, with some kind of review of policies and procedures and to, to kick down some barriers and make things better. Um, we also will talk in specific about some of the policies themselves. And, and, and we, uh, I want to make sure that you know that we are still open to receiving input. So e even if you have some today, and uh, in, into March, 
If you have some ideas of items that need to be considered, please send them to us. Uh, there is an online submission form. Um, also, like I say, you can, I imagine you can send it to, to any of us, uh, send an idea, and we'll, we'll get it on the list. We're happy to receive input for that. But again, part of our charge, too, is to say, how do we make this an ongoing process and sustainable into the future? All right, questions, ideas. Yes. Here comes Leslie in with the microphone. In our regional, yeah. in our regional meeting yesterday, we discussed the issue of access versus the limitations on the number of learning support students that some campuses have been given. Has, has your committee discussed that at all? We have discussed uh, access, um, learning support, et cetera, and be happy to take additional deeper dive into that. Just to keep her busy, Come all the way to the back corner. Thank you. We've been talking the past two days about um, restricting or narrowing the choices that the students make and we actually have some board of regents policies that are somewhat restrictive on allowing the student us at the campus level to restrict their choices so i think we really need to look at the core policy as it's written and make it so that it's easier for the schools to narrow some of those pathways that is a good one yeah linda said she'll take care of that <laughs> And you're going to take care of Area F, right? Okay. <laughs> Did the committee look at um, the idea of when you do, say, a reverse uh, transfer, mm -hmm. um, the schools don't get credit <laughs> for retention and other kinds of things. So um, are you all looking at that whole area? Yeah. Uh, first time, full time freshman versus the transfers and all of this as far as student credit. I yeah, mean, as so far as uh, university really. And, and actually, that's an excellent point. I know that was an, an issue on our campus in talking about reverse transfer. Um, and so, yeah, we did discuss that. And, I, and the idea of who gets credit and appropriately assigning credit, I think, is, is significant because you accomplish what you measure, as, as we sometimes say. Ken. Oh, wait a minute. Houston well, Davis. The funding formula commission has also taken that under account. That's one of the guided focal areas that is sort of some broad parameters. We know as, as John Brown and his staff are working through modeling that formula and working across with PCS counterparts, that we need to be able to count those successes, uh, both in the, the sending as well as the receiving comment, uh, whether it be a reverse transfer or a new general transfer. Uh, we need to make certain that the funding Great point. Thank you, Houston. And again, to emphasize on this, no, the, this group isn't necessarily going to figure out everything with the first transfer, but it's of this list of 100 things or 150 things, really, you know, where should we really get some um, campus experts in and devote some time to say, let's figure this out. This is a real priority area, and, and that'll be the next step from that. Ken, did the committee look at the application admissions process across institutions, especially as it relates to uh, transient credit in the summers. Uh, we, we face problems with application deadlines from one USG unit to another. And I have a student who needs to pick up a course at Georgia Perimeter. And we missed their deadline. And now hmm. they can't transient as effectively. Has that been addressed? Max, I don't know. If, I can't recall if we looked at the uh, deadlines issue per se. I know we looked at summer transient issue. Uh, but I think I see Linda writing notes. We'll take a look at that. Anybody else? Are you looking at suspension policies? One of the things I see dealing with students who are on suspension that really do want to be there and really do want to continue their education, 
they can't even earn credits from any other institution while they're out. And it seems like a wasted year and a policy that's maybe outdated. And we might look at some alternatives to suspension as kind of a punishment, go away for a year and come back. Um, especially for students who, uh, there's a lot of reasons they might be suspended and we probably could do better with those. Um, well, excellent point. We'll put it on the list. Thank you. One thing too would be the uh, wide variety of GPAs. Uh, we, we found we had about 10 GPAs. Uh, and these are barriers to success at our own institution, but they're barriers at other institutions. So we've take, taken some efforts to reduce that number down to something we could figure out. Uh, hmm. Another new topic. It's a great idea. Thank you. See, I don't have to answer anything. I just say great idea. I like that. <laughs> What's that? That's right. That's, that's why they put me as chair, because I don't know anything. So. Could you give us an update on financial aid, tuition, affordability, discussions and policies that are in progress right now? You want to take Linda. I'd like to punt that to Houston Davis <laughs> on the affordability piece. Um, but to be honest, unless there's something going on, I don't know. The deep dive into these various policy areas is what's going to come out of this task force recommendation. So this task force itself is not resolving all of those. There are lots of tangential groups that are working on issues around this that we feel like those folks will, will then be further engaged to do that kind of deep dive. So we're going to reach out to our existing advisory groups, learning co consortium, those kinds of things. My understanding, though, is that Georgia State is piloting the Oh, Georgia Tech is piloting. Yeah, there are, there are some pilots going on, but in terms of coming up with a system-wide discussion about that, that deep dive has not happened yet. Houston? Well, I'd say that's a good example. I mean, you've got, you've got that activity that's going on in Georgia Tech. I mean, inside of a lot of your complete college Georgia activities, um, there, are, there are things that we're almost considering pilots that are going to inform these policy discussions. One of the things that, that we promised to Ken and this group was that they did not have to feel the weight of the world on them in, in doing this exercise and coming up with all the, the answers but we, we would like for them to work through, and it literally is about 100 different distinct ideas um, that need to be lifted up and, and reconsidered in policy, and help us work toward the five to 10 to 15 absolute most pressing barriers and challenges that are there. And then we're gonna roll up our sleeves for about a 12 month period of time. I can promise you this, Hank Huckabee, Houston Davis, our board, there's, there's no policy that's sitting there as a sacred document. That, that we're not willing to take a look at. Um, uh, policy should be a dynamic thing. It should be something that, that, that is in a modern higher education enterprise that helps us move, move our operations forward. It shouldn't be something that we're just looking at as, well, yeah, that's what it says from 1988, so we've left it that way for all this time. But as we're working through the CCG activities especially, I keep hearing from many of you that here's something that we know would make a huge difference in our students' lives. We really would like to pursue that, but we've got an internal, sometimes it is your campus, so, and many times it's a board policy that's standing. So those are the ones that we're wanting to get up there front and center, and let's start tackling them. Because in some ways, a uh, big message that Stan Jones and his group have is that time is the enemy. Uh, I think that may have been one of the themes of last year's summit. Um, when it comes to these policy barriers, there's no time like the present to start working on those five, six, or seven uh, big ones. Uh, Ken, Ken and his group, they have done an incredible job in a very short period of time, um, and at least starting to pull that list down. But by all means, this is, this is going to be not only during the six months, but as we continue conversations with Raxa, Raxa with other key groups, to keep feeding us. When you identify something that's not been thought of, uh, the GPA, I agree, that's one that I've not heard uh, come up yet. Um, the idea of people being able to transfer freely between our institutions. We're a system of institutions. We had a great side conversation with Bill Whelan the other day. SACS is open to a lot of these things that we're talking about. They just want to know how are we documenting the quality and how are we making certain to cover things with, with documentation of what we're doing, why we're doing it, um, and how we can vouch for that being good experience. Thank you, Houston. And I'd like to just echo, I've had a couple of conversations with Houston. There's nothing that's come up as weird and radical as it may sound, uh, where he said that's off base. In fact, he says, ooh, let's look at that. So uh, 
thank you again for that, that attitude. Uh, a couple of issues I wanted uh, to bring up. One is a, probably a quick response. Is uh, uh, need-based aid a part of this discussion? Is that considered a policy issue? Oh, it is. Um, you probably, some of you may have heard uh, Chancellor Huckabee talk about the fact that uh, if Georgia's not at the bottom of the list, you can see the bottom of the list very clearly uh, <laughs> where we stand relative to other states in need-based aid. It is a huge problem. Some of it is grounded. Uh, there are some statutory limitations um, that have to be tackled, but we also need to think creatively about how much can we work in the margins that is just policy, those things that are within the control of the board. Um, we are uh, going to be engaged in an activity uh, during this next six months of taking a look at unmet need across the entire system. There's a lot of data that you already uh, give to the, to the system office in the way of financial aid use, um, you know, looking at the student record system. Uh, that information about unmet need and then looking at how we're using the existing resources and not to get into a sacred cow, how is hope really being used? I mean, to a certain extent, we need to be looking at in segments of students, are we over awarding available grant aid compared to under award? Um, those are the tough questions that need to be answered by various sectors uh, that may, may tell us different things. But need-based aid is going to be a huge focus as we look at the next 12 to 18 months. Um, I think that uh, things such as the REACH scholarship program that uh, Governor Deal has provided leadership on, and I look at that as a test bed of a proof of concept. Uh, showing that need-based aid really can make a huge difference. As we start looking at adult degree completion, and I know many of your CCG plans have a lot of what you're trying to do with adult degree completion, thinking about how we can utilize the, uh, things like access challenge grants and the like uh, to be able to show that a 500 to, I think Tim Rennick had a presentation yesterday where he was talking about what a big difference that $500 to $700 would make in the re-enrollment of the student. When we're down to that kind of money and as big a budget as we got, um, it, it's on us to take a hard look at how we're using our existing resources. The other issue is related to hope, and it just, it just smacks me in the face of what we've been hearing the last couple of days, of how important it is for students to, to take at least 24 hours a year, uh, and this, this encouragement to, uh, to, to complete the, uh, your education as quickly as possible, and hope is kind of runs in the face of that, uh, with uh, students taking fewer hours so that they can maintain their B average. That, that's a very political issue and not just a policy issue, but, but yeah. still Houston one Houston will deal with that one, too. You're going to answer that one, too? That's great. I, I appreciate that. You're welcome to come <laughs> at the stage anytime, Houston. <laughs> but actually, at the same time, a few items have come up that um, actually deal more with kind of legislative issues, and uh, those are getting a full vetting as well, and as far as how we can address them to you know, members of the legislature. Ralph? Can, um, you alluded to earlier that a lot of the policies that came into you were campus policies as opposed to system. And I assume your committee was primarily to look at system level policies, but how do we encourage campuses to look at their internal policies that are also creating some of these barriers for students? Actually, that's a great idea. I can, we have not done that systematically, uh, and I think that's a good idea. Um, this is one of those. Um that, that policy back there, the areas for collaboration was primarily campus policy, which we weren't thinking about until we got these suggestions that, that these are similar questions on, on different campuses or they might have very different policies trying to achieve the same thing. Um, so I think we, we may look at trying to figure out how to pick some specific topics or model policies and saying, this is, we know this is working here. You might need to change it to adapt it here and so on. But I think that's a, a key area for collaboration that we're hearing based on on, on, on this process that we aimed at system, but clearly something to do at, at campus level too. You know, one of the things that we've talked about, and I'm thinking it may be my next book project, but it's the concept of board policy folklore. Because often what traps a campus is the firm belief, what traps a campus is the firm belief that it is board policy when in fact it isn't. So we've got to find ways to communicate, maybe even just an FAQ page. Uh, you know, what is, what is common perception but not really board policy? Uh, I, I'm not sure we want to put that out for the public, but there's, <laughs> there really, you know, sometimes there's been a memo from someone that is not actually board policy, but it was written in 1992, and it has continued to guide campus practice for too long. Actually, I'd have to say, when I became provost, I think that was the most common statement I heard. The board won't let us do that. And we found out that usually was not the case. So. All right. 
Um, Omar. Hey, Linda, to that end, I think we ought to suggest that we take a half a day sometime during the year and have every employee of the system read the board policy manual. <laughs> just, just, let's just, just take a half, half a day. day out and ask everybody to read it. Because you're right, it, it, it clogs up the works. Uh, one of the things I think that's obvious is the lack, the absence, and policy will have to drive this, but the absence of a comprehensive fully integrated data system among the now 31 institutions for someone that calls itself a system is unbelievable. <laughs> there is, for example, President Burns brought this up, there is an awful lot of lateral movement of students between our institutions. And all you have to do is look at the start of a semester and see that that absence of an integrated data system for student records, financial aid eligibility, uh, who's suspended, who's not suspended, and why, is a huge obstacle. Because we have a student who wants to move, and I'll pick Max's institution from ABAC to Gordon, and our start and stop dates don't coincide, our final transcript and grades are not ready before his admissions people need for its the absence of a system-wide data system is just so obvious. Uh, I think it really needs to be addressed. Excellent point. Michael? I think implied in that is a system-wide calendar, either alignment and start-stop dates about the system with dangers and other topics. Okay, Michael Crafton. <laughs> 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 I was put up by my colleagues to answer this. <laughs> but I think it's worth looking, especially with online degrees, consortia. I mean, all of these, I think, are relevant to trying to line up, tighten the calendar. Yeah. So the point, if you didn't hear, the beginning of that was to try to at least align or tighten uh, calendars across, uh, across the various institutions, which was implied in the other question. All right. Uh, last one, please. OK. Last question. Yes, I'd like to uh, see some changes with the dual enrollment options. Uh, students in the K through 12 system are completing these career pathways, but yet they're limited to core classes. I'd like to see if a student completes criminal justice pathway to be able to take an introduction to criminal justice at the college level, introduction to education, uh, introduction to business. Hmm. And those are limited to students right now, but these are classes that would encourage students along the college enrollment and in addition to that, we also limit dual enrollment to the high achieving students. So we may want to look at some options for, for some students that uh, come from the, the disadvantaged backgrounds in regards to dual enrollment. Those are some barriers that we're mm. facing right now in our community in trying to encourage students to participate in dual enrollment programs, performance learning centers, uh, those type of options would be considered. Another is the uh, online application that the series of lawful presence questions that are not mandatory. Those are causing us um, major complications in admissions because you know it's not mandatory that you, you state how long you've lived in Georgia, but that's tied to state law. So we're requiring students to give more information to prove that, but if the question was mandatory on the admissions application, it would prevent us from having to go back and ask for additional information from students and to accelerate their acceptance and enrollment in the institution. That's good. Actually, we discussed lawful presence a little bit. Uh, but that, that's some other good information. So again, thank you very much. Thank you. So again, thanks. Um, we really do hope that, that this type of conversation doesn't stop and we're going to be working on making sure there's a web presence for a, a portal for suggestions, changes to policies, FAQs on policies, and then we have other um, integrate discussions like these into other events that, because this will be ongoing, that we're interested in studying and looking at these and making changes. Um, so back to the little storyboard. Um, I want to talk about briefly, um, in the last 10 minutes we have here, hopefully less than that, uh, upcoming, upcoming things, upcoming ideas we have, and um, to support the work that's in the campus plans and continue this connecting work, driving to um, implement what, what, what you've planned out. Uh, so I'm going to just go through these briefly, one by one. Expert resources. Again, I pointed out Tabitha. Um, I want to jump to, where's Felita? Stand up, Felita. Uh, Felita Williams, if, if you haven't heard, um, the Gozueta Foundation has kindly um, given the system a grant. You know, they funded a lot of you. 
um, before, but of, of looking at how we connect um, either model programs going on with Latino access and success, and, and, and what we can do at a, at a system level to support that work and, and move that elsewhere too. Um, so Felita is going to be running that project over the next two years. So you'll see a big push from us on Latino access and success. And you heard yesterday from Joe and Laura that that's the fastest growing population in K through 12 and will be the fastest growing population in our institutions. And we need to do something about that. Um, we know it's coming. And, and we saw a great example from Armstrong yesterday, if you were in here for the sessions on, on what they're doing on that. Um, one of those expert resources, though, is we're going to get funding from Gazueta to hire, a, um, say, a national expert or, or consultant of a type to sp specifically go out and support and work with you on your programs and, and what, what you could be doing um, around Latino access and success. So we'll be looking for that. And Tabitha's available for K-12. We have a lot of existing um, people in, in uh, system office around, uh, around dual enrollment, around adult learning, around uh, students with disabilities, um, military, so on. We're going to be looking to make sure that, that um, these are easily accessible, that it's clear that, that these people are available and can help you and support in the implementation and connect you with campuses and um, who are doing good work in this area. So be looking for that. Uh, incubator. We want to take, it's just a little bit of money, but we're going to announce a, um, a competition of sorts next week where we're partnering with UGA's Institute for Higher Education. Uh, what we want to do is find some of these projects that either are hard to get budget funding for, are new ideas, or came directly out of the campus plans. And um, this is going to be a competitive grants type process. You'll see the focus areas up here. Um, you know, we heard from Tinto on the importance of faculty engagement. And so some are specifically around faculty planning. Uh, others around demonstration startup issues, around these areas for growth that we talked about in the campus plans. So learning analytics and the interventions associated with that. New models, perhaps focused on learning rather than just instruction. And specifically extending partnership development or any ideas that you got from here. So um, taking what you have in the plans, taking what you've talked about for these past two days and heard, and putting some money out there to do these demonstration projects. and, and try to get some um, good successes in the next six, six months to a year um, and support you on that. So we'll send out details to everybody about that process and um, the application will be quick but, um, and relatively short, hopefully. Uh, but please look for that and it should be exciting. Um, another one, we're working with Georgia Tech's Center for 21st Century Universities. We heard yesterday on, um, I think it was from Jim Applegate about uh, student involvement and that students should actually be connected in this process. And so, um, and after reviewing the plans too, seeing um, in cases either where students were involved or in a lot with, where they weren't and that we need to get them into this. Uh, so, we want to do a set of unconferences um, where we bring faculty, administration, and students together around topics on completion. Uh, we'll provide kind of the model, the initial research, data collection, and Georgia Tech will provide a facilitator, and we would love to partner with a few campuses on some of these suggested topics or what you think might be appropriate for students at your school to get them involved in Complete College Georgia, at least um, issues of completion. So uh, Leslie Fenton's email address is on there. If you're interested and want to be a partner, um, we can talk about that. Please contact us. We'd like to hold these pretty soon. Um, potential roundtables, again, these are coming right out of the areas of growth. Analytics, we're hearing a lot on, so expect something from that. Um, advising, we're hearing a lot on. Um, extending partnerships, cities, and that most of our population is in cities. Not to ignore what's going on in rural areas, but um, typically mayors in that level of government has something that's not been engaged in college completion work, and we're actually seeing some good examples um, up from Northeast in Buffalo where the whole uh, community has been involved, and they're seeing great, um, great improvements in college completion from engaging that level of government. So we're thinking about that idea. Um, running out of time, so uh, first year success. Again, one of the big focus areas that I started with. So I just want to give you a quick example of we, where we are looking at all our work where there may have been disparate initiatives and trying to say, what do we need to focus on to really drive college completion? Similar conversations that you're having on your campus. So we had 
these two separate areas, alignment with K-12, transforming remediation. We know we want the significant pipeline increase. What do we do about it? So we've been working on this and working with you on this, on trying to bring these together. And two specific areas of work under those buckets that we gave you in the completion plans, the Complete College America grant models, which have been showing great promise at two of our institutions, um, one in math, one in English language arts, and then Common Core Standards and the recent conference that went on um, that faculty from each of your institutions came to and met with K-12 instructors and heard from national experts on thinking about the importance of this change that's coming from K-12. through And really, all it is about, both of these, is improved success in intro courses. And again, we just heard from Tinto and others that this is really where a lot of focus is on nationally of there's a big drop off in the first year, so let's look at introductory courses. Let's try to make sure that we're aligning what we're doing in remediation, what we're, we're aligning what we're doing in K through 12, we're aligning what we're doing in STEM, um, and just talking about what is it gonna take to have successful gateway courses. So the big thing from us, improve success in intro courses, and we're gonna make sure that our initiatives are aligning to that and helping you support that work. Um, so bring it all back together. The three themes we started with. If you take anything away from this, um, again, rather than the Mack truck of the big campus plans last year and sitting on all these 100 areas to make sure you're hitting on 100 different strategies, we're focusing on first year success, this learner relationship management of the analytics and interventions under that, and these implementation drivers like policy, uh, data. And these are the big things that we're gonna be focusing on to help support you in implementing college completion work. So with that, I just want to turn over to Linda real quick to talk about um, just a quick update that we'd like on the plans. Thank you all. Um, <clears throat> as you know, we, we get a lot of questions about what's next with these campus plans. And we really want to recognize the fact that these campus plans are living documents. Uh, what you submitted last year is going to be informed by everything that you're working on and implementing, implementing here forward. So we are working to put in a sustainable reporting process that allows you to modify those plans, report on your plans, et cetera, et cetera. So what we're thinking about is that we will be doing, um, this year we'll be doing updates to the campus plans, short narratives, two to five pages, where we're focusing on key issues. What are the changes that you'd like to make? Obviously, you've, you've learned some things since this time last year when you started working on them. Uh, even since you submitted them last year. What progress are you making? What are your key observations? Other evidence that you're finding to inform changes in the plan? We're particularly interested in lessons learned and implications. Some of, some of you wrote plans with initiatives being a good idea. Where are you now on those initiatives? Um, we will be uh, releasing some dates. We, one of the things we did as you were working on your plans last year was we held these uh, virtual webinars so that people could talk with each other about things uh, and we'll set a few of those up for you between now and then. Uh, we're thinking these, these short narrative updates would be due to us by June 1st. Uh, we, last year we did kind of a peer sharing uh, of your drafts of campus plans and one of the things it was helpful I think to get feedback on your plan but more importantly it allowed a system lens looking at what other campuses were doing so we'd like to keep that um, sharing process in place. I think it did to build a lot out in terms of knowledge, capacity, and awareness and opportunities for partnerships and collaboration. Uh, so we're thinking engage in your draft some sort of sharing process with that. We'll get some feedback from that sharing process back to you with your final plans due to us by September 1st and then we will coordinate both internally within our system and with the technical college system uh, to get these updates to the governor by October 1st and we hope that time frame will give you a, a little more time especially between now and then to continue to engage your faculty, your community partners, your K-12 partners, things of that nature. Thank you.